Welcome back into our class TH110, okay? and this is the course on doctrines, the doctrines of the Bible. And we're specifically dealing with the doctrine of God, and we come to section number 11 here on the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God. Let me take this opportunity to welcome in all of our pastors, okay, from from, from Asia and our pastors in from Africa, as uh, because many people don't know that we got people tuning in now by way of messenger, we got people tuning in by way of WhatsApp, and we got people coming in by way of Zoom. And I want to, and, and we have lots of text messages coming in, so I want to take this opportunity just to please welcome all our pastors that are coming in, tuning in in this particular session. What we want to do is continue looking at doctrine number 11, sub-doctrine number 11, under the doctrine of God, and we're looking at specifically the wisdom of God. Now, this particular subject, okay, happens to be a very vast vast, complicated, and simple subject uh, at the same time. And we want to look at some, some basic definitions as to the wisdom of God. Now, if God is omniscient, and God is sovereign, and He is omniscient, and He is sovereign, okay, He knows all things, He then we must be willing as believers to abandon ourselves to the wisdom of God. Now, immediately it draws a picture for us, and that picture is that we are finite human beings and God is infinite. So there is absolutely no comparison, and, it's, and it should let us know immediately that we're, there are a lot of things about God we're not going to understand. So I want to ask you to open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 9. And let's go back and study this in Proverbs chapter 9 and look at one verse, verse 1, Proverbs 9, 1. And now remember, for all of you, you have, we, you have different Bibles, you have different translations, you have different language Bibles. I happen to be teaching out of the New American Standard Version of the Bible, so just follow along. And it says in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1, he says, Wisdom has built her house, she has hewn out her seven pillars. Wisdom has built her house, she has hewn out her seven pillars. What are we talking about here? When we look at this, okay, well, first of all, let's give a very brief explanation. That, that is that the wisdom of God is used in three senses in the scriptures, okay? It's used in three different ways in the scriptures. Number one, it refers to the higher perspective by which God understands things that man is incapable of understanding. Let me repeat that. Okay? Number one, it refers to the higher perspective by which God understands things that man is incapable of understanding. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's look at this in verse 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25. He says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now that, think about that very carefully with me. <clears throat> that 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 really sets us. That is what that is what really sets God apart from His creation. It, it definitely sets Him apart from us because He says the imagine imagine that the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is beyond our comprehension, and yet it should encourage us to abandon ourselves to the omniscience, okay, to the sovereignty, to the all-knowing power for God. Right? And the second way that we understand the wisdom of God is that it can refer to the understanding which a Christian should have in life. Okay? Let me repeat that. It can refer to the understanding which a Christian should have in life. Let me show you this. Go back to the book of Proverbs chapter 4. And in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, I want you to see this in verse 7. Specifically in verse 7, he says, The beginning of wisdom is what? The beginning of wisdom is to acquire wisdom. And with all your acquiring, get understanding. With all your acquiring, get understanding. Okay? So we're to, we are to acquire the understanding that we're capable of okay? by virtue of the fact that if, in fact, we're born again, we have been regenerated, we've been washed in the blood, we've been empowered by the person of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit lives in our lives, okay? The Word of God lives in our lives. So we're more than capable, okay, of getting understanding. That's the second way we understand the wisdom of God. Why? So what is the understanding we get? It's, we get it from the wisdom of God. And then the third way that we, we understand this is that wisdom is seen as a type of Christ. Wisdom is seen as a type of a person, the person of Christ, who is what? He is our wisdom. He is our wisdom. 
go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see this in verse 30. Verse 30. He says, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. And he says, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now notice the three things that he became for us. Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So let's illustrate this a little bit. You remember David. Okay, King David. Okay, and remember when David said that Abner died as a fool. Remember that. Okay? Turn your Bibles to Second Samuel chapter three. I want you to see this. <clears throat> it says that David said that Abner died as a fool. Now that's an incredible statement, and we see this here in Second Samuel chapter three, verse thirty-three. Now, what did he mean by that? He meant that Abner died because he followed his own intuition. He followed his own intuition rather than what? Rather than the wisdom of God, which would have saved him. Now, we see this in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 33. Let's read it. It says, The king chanted a lament for Abner and said, Should Abner die as a fool dies? He was killed. He was killed as he turned aside, okay, in the gate of Hebron, okay? But he entered the city, okay, of refuge, as God had instructed, and Joab would have... Now, if he had entered, right, the city, the uh, refuge, as God had instructed, Joab would have been uh, would have been unable to kill him, right? So, what would be the simple application of this, okay? Okay. Um, and that is that as, as wise Christians, okay, or as a wise Christian, okay, a wise Christian will obey, okay, the wisdom of God. Now, we don't have to always understand the wisdom of God, but we must be willing to obey the wisdom of God. So now, let's just take it one step further. What is the multifaceted wisdom of God? What is the manifold wisdom of God? Okay. And that's a great question because we take the questions that come in from the pastors and let's begin to address this. Now, we spent some time dealing with the pastors in the country of India on this particular subject and we will continue to do so. <clears throat> and now we have pastors that are joining in from not only from India, but from Pakistan, okay, from Myanmar, and we got them coming in from Bangladesh, okay, as well as from eight other countries in Africa. And so I'll take that opportunity to address everybody on this particular question, which is what is the manifold or the multifaceted wisdom of God? Let me ask you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Now we're going to be, begin to see Okay, the wisdom of God and what we now know as the birth of the church, okay, the beginning of the church, the purpose of the church. Okay? And so let's begin to see this in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. And we're going to answer the question, and this is the question that's going to really direct us for the, for the remainder of this hour. What is the master, what is the multifaceted wisdom of God, or what is the manifold wisdom of God? In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, let's read it. It says, So that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now might now be known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Now look at this because the apostle Paul was making a statement here. And and don't forget something. The apostle Paul was in the middle of a prayer. The Apostle Paul was praying at this particular point, at this junction, okay? And the Apostle Paul never missed a teaching opportunity, okay? Because in Ephesians chapter 3, now, now let's go back and look at verses 1 through 13. Verses 1 through 13. He interrupted his own prayer to expound on something we know as, that, that is known as the divine mystery. The divine mystery and the divine mystery of God revealed in the New Testament church of Jesus Christ. Now, this wisdom, this multifaceted wisdom, now look at this now. Now, as we go, as we, as we begin to read this in verses 1 through 13, and let's open our Bibles to that, okay? I want you to understand a few things, okay? In the natural realm, in this natural world that we live in, okay? Uh, let's be honest, okay? Most of us will never have anything to do with each other, okay? Uh, that, and that is because we tend to live within our own cultural pattern, our own cu subculture. We live within our dialect, our own language, okay, within our own nationalities. And people tend 
because of eth ethnicity, okay, okay, we tend to group ourselves with those who are very, very much like ourselves. Okay? Now, the church, when the church is birthed, okay, we begin to see a wisdom of God that was not anticipated. It was not anticipated and it was not understood by Israel. Now, don't forget the question. What is the manifold wisdom of God? What is the multifaceted wisdom of God? And now we're going to begin to see something that God is revealing to the New Testament church you know, okay, of Jesus Christ about his wisdom with regard to his redemption, to his rescuing, to his salvation okay, of mankind. And we begin to see this in what we know as the New Testament church. Now, the New Testament church should, rep should be representative of the manifold wisdom of God over multifaceted wisdom of God. Now, if you understand that, and give me a moment to develop that, let's now read the text. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3, and let's read this verses 1 through 13. Let's begin verse 1. For this, reason, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, this is crucial, for you Gentiles, okay, those of us who are not Jewish, he says, if indeed you have heard of the administration of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there be known to me the mystery, as I write before briefly, verse 4, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which in other generations was not made known to mankind as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and, and prophets in the spirit. Verse 6, to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow pro heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made what? I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power to me the very least of all saints this is this was Paul's perspective of himself <clears throat> he says to me the very least of all saints this grace was given to preach to the gentiles to preach to the gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ Paul is now breaking out of okay out of the ethnic group of Jews and Jews only, and he's breaking out into the Gentile world. And this is the mystery of, of the church. Look what he says in verse 9. And to enlighten all people, look at this, underscore all, enlighten all people, <clears throat> he says, as to what the plan of the mystery is, which was, which was for the ages have been hidden in God, who created all things. <clears throat> So that the multifaceted wisdom of God, look at verse 10, so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now, might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. That's an incredible verse. This was, in verse 11, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, verse 12, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Verse 13. Therefore, I ask you not to become discouraged about my tribulations in your behalf, since they are your glory. Now, so we know that Christ comes to his own first, right? We understand that from the Gospel of John, very clearly stated there. And we know that Judaism was pretty much an exclusive group of people, right? Except for those who are converted over to Judaism. And we know that it was basically an ethnic group. We understand that. Jesus comes, and we see that through various prophecies in the Old Testament. We see it fulfilled in the New Testament. When Christ comes to the cross, he dies for all mankind. Okay, And, then, and now we see this in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only what? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe okay, shall not perish but have what? E uh, eternal life. Now. So now we have, okay, Jesus Christ breaks the barriers, okay, 
now everybody outside of Judaism, okay, now Christ comes to die, okay, for all those, as we know, as the elect, for those who are going to be saved. And we now have untold millions and millions and millions and millions, okay, of people who are not Jewish now coming into the church. This is the manifold wisdom or the multifaceted wisdom of God. That in mind, and we see this very clearly in the prophecies, okay, in the Old Testament, that the Gentiles, God had the Gentiles in mind. Now, the Old Testament didn't understand that. We see that in the New Testament, now it's being revealed to us. Now, what is absolutely fascinating to me is that today, today, doesn't matter what country you're in, okay, we tend to be exclusive, very much like Judaism. Isn't that fascinating? And so we have, so if you're in Pakistan, okay, you would have all, all the church members are basically be from Pakistan, okay? Or you're from India, okay, all the church members will basically be, be from India. You follow me, okay? Okay, depending on what part of India you are, what part of Pakistan you're in, okay? And you have your, and you have your sub-ethnic group there. And, and we have the same thing in Africa, okay? And I've been to 14 countries in Africa, and I see this everywhere. Okay? We see this all over Latin America. We see this in Europe. We see this in Asia. And so, instead of becoming inclusive, we've gone right back and reverted back to becoming exclusive. Okay? It's absolutely fascinating to me, okay, how we would do the opposite of, of what God tells us to do. This is the multifaceted wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God. We just read this here. Now, the previously hidden fact, I'm going to repeat that, the previously hidden fact or the previously hidden secret, okay, was now made known. Both Jews and Gentiles would share equally in the gospel of salvation. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 6. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 6. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, what right do you, what right do I, what right do we have to exclude other people simply because they don't have the same color of our skin, okay? They don't have our same dialect, they don't have our same language, they don't have our same cultural patterns, and blah, 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 and you know, they don't have our hair, no hair, whatever it is, okay? We, and, we, and this is what we tend to do. We become exclusive rather than becoming inclusive. This is the manifold wisdom of God. Just out of curiosity, what heaven do you think you're going to? The one that only looks just like you? No, listen to me. Look, God had a very specific purpose. God had a very specific purpose for using the church, for using the church in this way. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 3 and now look at verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11. He says, verse 10, so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the, and the authorities in the heavenly places. Do you see that? In the heavenly places. The, and look, look at verse 11. This was, in accordance, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now the word translated um, multifaceted here in verse 10 or manifold, okay, in Ephesians 3.10, you know what it means? It means many and varied, many and varied. It means it means having many features and many forms. That's what that word means, okay? It means wrought, okay, in various colors, in various colors. It means to be intricate. It means to be diversified. It means to be many-sided. It means complex. This is what, when, when we talk about the multifaceted wisdom of God or the manifold wisdom of God, okay? So God's wisdom in his extraordinary plan of salvation as seen in the new and the mysterious creation of the what? Of the church, is a multifaceted, many-colored, culturally diverse, rich, and beautiful community of believers. This is, look, there is no other, how can I say it? There is no other human co-op, there is no other human institution like it in the world. That's the church. Okay? Now, if you, and, and I've read, I'll, 
I've, I've read a bunch of Bible commentators, okay? And according to many Bible commentators, this, the manifold or the multifaceted wisdom of God is, is poetic, okay? It's a poetic and artistic expression. It's a poetic and artistic expression suggesting that the intricate nature of, a, of, an, of, a, of a, an embroidered pattern as, for example, as in Joseph's tunic. Remember Joseph's tunic, okay? The tunic of many colors. Let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. Now, in the New King James Version, it says, tunic of many colors. Now, in the in the um, New American Standard Version of the Bible, it says it this way. In, in Genesis chapter 37, verse 3, verse 3, says this. Now, Israel loved... Israel loved Joseph more than the other sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a multicolored tunic, a multicolored tunic. This is what the body of Christ is to look like. Now, obviously, well, and as I said earlier, we live in our own cultural ethnic groups, okay? And that's, that, that's just a natural tendency that we, we live in. However, when people from the outside come in, into the body of Christ, we're to openly receive them and not treat them any different because that is the manifold wisdom, the manifested wisdom of God, that the church is, should be a reflection, much like, much like Joseph's tunic, multicolored. Okay? And that and that expression and that representation should be seen throughout the hierarchy okay, of the body of Christ and the church because we've been washed by the same blood, that's the blood of Jesus Christ, filled by the same spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, okay? and we're under the same command of the same word, the word of God. And so we take time to look at this. Why? Because many of you, you pastors in Asia and you pastors, okay, in the, in the East and many of you pastors in Africa have told me that you have to struggle with the same ethnic issues that the Western world has to struggle with, okay? It's just, it's just it may be a different group, a different language, another, okay? But it's still the same issues. Now, so we see this now. Now, each member... Each member of the body of Christ or the body of God manifests a different aspect of God's image. And that's what I want you to see with me. Each member, okay, of the body of Christ manifests, okay, a different aspect of God's image. Let me show you this. Turn your, go back all the way to the beginning. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, and let's look at verses 26 and 27. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. It says, it says, verse 26, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the livestock, Look at this, and over the all and over all the earth and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. And he says in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Do you see that? So that's everybody on this earth. I've been to the four corners of the world to teach the word, to preach the word, preach the gospel, okay, to disciple and train pastors. And when I and I tell you, <clears throat> And you see this multicolored, multifaceted representation of the image of God. That's the richness of the mystery of the church. Turn your Bibles to James chapter 3, verse 9. James chapter 3, verse 9. We're talking about, remember the question. The question is, what is the multifaceted or the manifold wisdom of God? Now, in James chapter 3, verse 9, we see it this way. He says, with it be, he says, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who have been made in the likeness of God. Now, he's talking about the power of the tongue. How is it possible that we okay, can bless God with our mouths and curse man simultaneously? How is that possible? It's very possible. Every ethnic group is very capable of doing that. I remember years and years ago, <clears throat> And this is in the late 1990s. I was in Johannesburg, South Africa. And the pastor of the church, lovely brother, lovely brother, South African brother, who, um, and he was a white South African who spoke Afrikaans. Mm -hmm. 
Now, he was a unique man in that he had broken away from the tradition of the Dutch Reform or the Dutch Anglican Church in South Africa. Okay? And he, w he was working among the tribes, he was working into the villages, he went into the riverbeds, he went into the jungle, he went into the mountains, okay? And he was evangelizing people. He didn't care what tribe they belonged, what color their skin, he, I mean, it, it didn't, and he went, and he developed, okay, a very large, I'm talking about, these were tens and thousands of new brothers and sisters who were coming into the body of Christ, and he would go alone to evangelize because his church refused to participate in it. And this is now, and there was still, and now there was, this was still some of the vestiges, the remaining issues of apartheid in that time period, okay? Which is basically discrimination and separation and blah, blah, blah. And so I'd gone with him to a number of villages and we went, I mean, I, I ministered all over with him in, in South Africa. We would go. <clears throat> and <clears throat> he invited me to his church. I went to his church, okay? And, um, he, and I stayed in his home. Now, this church was a very large church. It was huge. It was a humongous church. I never forgot this. Okay? And the parking lot was so huge. It, it was amazing. It was like, it was, it was Johannesburg's, okay, um, um, uh, um, um, uh, mega church, okay? And so I stood in his house, and his house was on the other side of the parking lot. I mean, and it looked like the length of two football fields. That's how big this place, the parking lot was. I mean, it would fill up on Sunday, okay? And so he went ahead to start the service and get everything going. And he says, as soon as you're ready, then come down, okay? And, and I went to the church. Okay? And as I got to the church, you had to come up these stairs. All the, I mean, it was, it, it was this concrete stairway, okay? And, and I looked at it and I said, wow. And so I walked all the way up, and there was these two deacons, these two deacons. I never forgot this. These two deacons. Now, I'm not a tall man. I'm not a short, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a short man. I'm not a tall man. And, um, and I walked up the stairs, okay? And these two giant men were standing there, okay? And they told me, and they, and they told me what was I doing there? I thought it was kind of a strange question. And I said, well, I'm going to church. I've been invited to come to church here. The pastor invited me. And so I started to walk to the door, and they literally stopped me. These guys were huge. And there was these two white South Africans. I mean, these guys were huge. They, I mean, their hands were massive hands, okay? And they put their hands, and he says, you're not welcome here. I said, excuse me? I said, I, 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 I've been invited by the pastor, okay? And, and they told me, turn around. Leave. I said, no, I'm not leaving. I've been invited by the pastors specifically. And I started going, and they grabbed me. They literally grabbed me. They put their hands under my armpits and walked me backwards all the way down the stairs. And, and, they, and they planted me, and they said, you're not welcome here. And they went right back up the stairs. Now, anybody who knows me will know that I, I tend to be a little stubborn about these things, okay? And so I went right back up again, okay? And again, they picked me up and brought me down. And I mean, I, I felt so small next to these two guys. They were huge. I mean, these two boys, they were big. I mean, these guys were corn-fed. I mean, these guys were big. And they took me down, and they dropped me again. And I went back up again, okay? Okay, and then they told me that I was going to get me a good old whipping, okay? And I looked at them, I said, what? And at that moment, and, and, they, and they had taken me down. And the pastor of the church came out, and he's and I can hear the congregation singing. Okay, and he said to me, he goes, "What took you?" I said, "They won't." Let, he asked me, "What took you so long?" I said, "Well, they won't let me in. They're telling me I'm not welcome here." And he, the pastor, was no bigger than me. Okay, and he looked at these two giants and he scolded them, and told them to stand down and step aside. And they did. And the pastor says, come here, All right? And he, the pastor put his arm around under my arm, and he walked me into the church. And the place was huge, filled with people. It was jam-packed. And he walked me all the way to the platform around 
stepped on the platform to sit down next to him, okay? And the singing stopped. The singing stopped. And the pastor looked at the choir, the choir director, and said, continue. Okay? And and they kept looking at me. And I, now, and so he sat me down and he said, I brought you here purposely today. I need you to preach the gospel to my people. I said, I've been with you all over the jungles and in the riverbeds. I mean, we've been out in the bush, man, we, and we've been up in the mountains. And you preach the gospel. He goes, my people will not accept anybody who is not a white South African. And I said, oh, so I'm your guinea pig. And he said, well, basically. And and I said, well, I don't mind. I, I'll, I'll preach the gospel to anybody. And so, and the singing went on and everything, and people... And finally, when the singing stopped, he got up and he greeted the congregation. And then he told me the guest speaker will be Dr. Eddie Ildefonso, okay? Okay? And a group of people got up and said, no. We will not be spoken to by a mulatto. And now, a mulatto, okay, okay, depending on what country you happen to be in, is typically, okay, is non-white, okay, has a different color of skin, um, is a mix is a mix ethnic group and blah 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 blah. Okay, and that's what they considered to me to be a mulatto. Okay, and a group of people got up angry and they walked right out the church. They walked right out. They said, "Then, then, then they got to put up with it." And the pastor got up. Okay, he said he understood, and then he rebuked the church, and and they were shocked when he rebuked them. Okay, I was shocked because I, he rebuked them, and he said, "Doctor Alfonso, come and preach," and I preached. I preached the gospel to these people. Okay, and I preached okay out of this passage here in Ephesians chapter three verses one through thirteen. Except the difference is that I preached it in detail, painfully slow detail. I broke it down. Okay, and 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 the, and this is and I said this is the manifold wisdom of God. This is the multifaceted from me. This was God's plan from the very beginning. Now, isn't it amazing to me? That this was God's plan, and we, uh, we in our little puny, finite minds, have decided that we're going to reject God's plan and reject God's wisdom, and we're going to elevate ourselves to the level of God, okay, and tell God what you're going to accept and not accept. You see, we must understand something about the manifold wisdom of God, the multifaceted form of God, okay? Wisdom of God. And that is that together, believers, together believers form a perfect blend of harmony and diversity. Now, the many features and the many forms and the many colors of fellowship in the church reflect the manifold wisdom of God. And from the earliest Christian, and particularly the Jews, the up to that time secret mystery of the church was truly a mind-blowing revelation, okay? Even the unseen rulers and the authorities, okay, of the heavenly places, okay? And that's what, that's what uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 talks about, okay? And he talks about that. It, it was revealed to the rulers and the authorities and the heavenly places. Now, we're learning about it for the first time. They were just learning about this for the first time. Okay, can you imagine that? And when I got to this section, okay, and I was explaining, he said, "Well, who were the rulers and the, and the authorities in heaven?" He was. The angels were learning about this for the very first time. Okay, as we come to the birth of the church. Now, to the Romans, the apostle Paul declared this. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. It says, oh, how great, how great are, are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. And that's the New Living Translation. Well, in the New American Standard Version, it says, oh, the depth of the riches, the both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. There are a lot of things we don't understand. In fact, Paul referred to the church as, look what he says. Turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And look what he says in verse 26 and 27. It doesn't matter what country you're in, what culture, and what ethnic group you're in. You know, we all have these differences where we discriminate each other, we mistreat each other, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. That's not the way it's supposed to be in the church. Now, you can justify it all you want. Right? Right? But you're still going to be wrong. 
Look what he says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. He says, that is the mystery which has been hidden. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints, verse 27, to whom God will God willed to make known what the wealth of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles is. Among the Gentiles is, that's all of us who are not Jewish, the mystery that is that is that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, God's mystery is Christ. That was his mystery, Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's what that's what Colossians um, uh, chapter two verse three says. Okay, now Jesus possesses the manifold wisdom of God. We can clearly see this. Jesus possesses the manifold wisdom of God. Now open your Bibles to First Corinthians chapter one verse twenty four. First Corinthians one right. First Corinthians chapter one verse twenty four, and and it, because it reveals it to the world through His body. Okay? So the manifold wisdom of God, okay, is being revealed to the world, to the world through his body. What is the body? The church. Look what he says in verse 24. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Do you see that? Now, drop down to verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, he says this, But it is due to him, but it is due to him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Do you see that? Okay. Well, we have Christ in us, right? We have the hope of glory in us. Now, it still astonishes, it still astonishes and overwhelms that God has chosen to package. God has chosen to package the treasure of his manifold wisdom in fragile human jars of clay. Let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And look with me and let's go down. Give me a moment. Um, let's look, down, let, look at verse 7. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, let's look at this in verse, let's, well, 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 let's look at verse 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Let's start with verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen containers so that the extraordinary greatness of the power will be of God and not for ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not abandoned struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying around in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Verse 11, he says, for we who live are constantly being handed over to death, because because of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our mortal flesh. Do you see that? Now, the Bible reveals the manifold wisdom of God as unsearchable. The Bible reveals the wisdom of God as deep. The Bible reveals the wisdom of God and it, that it is beyond measure. Hmm? Let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, let's look at verse 28. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Do you know do you not know? Look at this. He starts out with a question, which you know is the answer is going to come. Look, he says, do you not know? Have you not heard that the, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is unsearchable. I don't have to understand God. I have to obey God. Turn your Bibles to the, the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 92, Psalm chapter 92, and look at verse 5, Psalm chapter 92, verse 5. He says, how great are your works, Lord, your thoughts are very deep. Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 147, Psalm chapter 147, look at verse 5. 
he says, great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. Poof. It is infinite. Now, go back to the book of James. Go back to chapter 3, the book of James. Now, James describes it as the wisdom from above, which is, first of all, it is pure, right? It is also peace and loving and, and, and giving at all times, right? And willing to yield to others, right? It is full of mercy and, 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 of, and, uh, and the fruit of good deeds, okay? It shows no favoritism. It's always sincere, right? Well, turn your Bibles to James chapter 3, verse 17. He says, But the wisdom from above is pure than peace, loving, gentile, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, free of hypocrisy. Free of hypocrisy. Do you see that? Now, on the other hand, on the other side of the coin, okay, if you will, okay, okay, is human wisdom, okay? Now, I want to be, uh, uh, let me see if I can put it this with you. Um, human wisdom has no merit of its own. D do you understand that? Human wisdom has no merit of its own. None. None. We have nothing to take credit for. Do you understand that there's a profound difference between inventing something and creating something? Do you understand that? Well, man can invent. You know, God has given man a wisdom that's beyond his understanding many times, okay? And he's a, and now we have invention after invention after invention after invention. But let me tell you something. Man can only invent from something from, 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 he, man can only invent from things that have already been created, okay? So there's a profound difference between creation and invention. God create, man events. Man inventions are from God's creation. So you have to understand that human wisdom has no merit on its own. Let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's look at this in verses 19, 20, and 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19, 20, and 21. Look what he says. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the understanding of those who have understanding. I will confound. This is God talking. Where, where is the wise person? Look at verse 20. Where is the wise guy? All right. He says, where is the wise person? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? What wisdom are we claiming to be of our own? Look at verse 21. For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. We're so smart. We're dummies. He says, it, he says, he says, for, for since the wisdom of God of the world, for, in the, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Go back to Isaiah. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29. And look what he says in verse 14. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous, and the wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the understanding of their men who have understanding will be concealed. Nevertheless, God gives his wisdom to humans as what? As a gift. That's what he's doing. He gives it as, as a gift. Look at this. Go to go to turn your Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter two. Let's go. Let's go. Proverbs. Let me turn my pages there. Uh, in my Bible. Go to Proverbs chapter two and give me a moment. Um, verse six. Verse six. Proverbs chapter two. Verse six. Look at this. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Human wisdom has no merit on its own. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul makes this even clearer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, let's start in verse 6. And in fact, you know, this actually, it, it's worth it. Let, let's go down verse 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, let's go all the way down to verse 16. First, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 16. Look at this. 
Yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which, was, which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard, and which have not entered the human heart, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Verse 10, for to us God revealed them through the Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Verse 11, for whom among people knows the thoughts of a person except the Spirit of the person, except the Spirit of the person that is in him. So also the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Verse 12, now we have not received, now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Verse 13, we also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in, the, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Verse 14, but a natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are, they are spiritually discerned. Verse 15, but the, one who is in, but the one who is spiritual discerns all things. But the one who is spiritual discerns all things, yet he himself is discerned by no one. Verse 16, for those who, for, for who, I'm sorry, verse 16, for who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. James says it this way. James has a great economy of words, right? He just reduced it down to one phrase. Turn your Bibles to James chapter 1, verse 5. And in James chapter 1, verse 5, he says it this way. He says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. You see, this is the reason why human wisdom on his own has no merit whatsoever. And his followers are to continue praying and asking him for spiritual wisdom. That's what we're called to do. Go, turn your Bibles to Colossians oh. chapter 1. Let's turn our Bibles to Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. And in Colossians chapter 1, um, verse 9. Verse 9. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Look what he says. For this reason we also... Since the day we heard about it, have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. You see, as believers, okay, we can picture the manifold wisdom of God as a global body of Christ shaped tapestry, as a global body, a, a, a body of Christ tapestry, okay. And our individual lives are the various colored threads, okay, woven together in the unity of purpose to display God's manifold wisdom through the church. We do this by taking the good news of salvation in Jesus to all the people of the world. That's what you and I are called to do. This is the multifaceted wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God. Get understanding.